when I was born very romantically in the Isles of Scilly was my younger brother. And I went back there again when I was in my early teens with my parents. And so the Isles of Scilly is obviously very special to me. And I've been over there several times now, did some work in the museum with mollusks and so on. But the Isles of Scilly is where it all began. So that was my beginning. And from there, and came back to Trelay and Trelay Vicarage, and it was there, in these wonderful grounds, that I started my interest in natural history, turning over stones and seeing what was underneath. And I remember I had, there was plenty of space. I remember in the old stables, I had a small room, which I called my museum room. And in that museum, I had it open on the fate day, um, which was, and I charged people tuppence or threepence or something. And I remember one man, I can remember him now, I remember his name, and I was bowled over because he gave me half a crown, which was then pretty well a week's wages. And this was meant to the fate um, money, of course. I didn't pocket it, but half a crown to see my little museum. So he must have been impressed. What was in your museum? Stella? And in my museum, I kept, <laughs> I, kept, I kept some living things. It wasn't all dead things. I kept mice, I kept white mice, uh, George and Mary named after the king and queen, and another little lady called Alice, and I think it was my first lesson in the horror of natural history, quite apart from any beauty of it, because I kept looking when, they, the, when George and Mary had babies. I kept looking at these delightful little, well, delightful, they were ugly little pink things, and uh, they didn't want to be sick, and so they ate them. I'll never, never forget the shock and the horror with which I discovered that the parents had eaten these little mice. So anyway, every day there was something interesting going on. And one time, remember, I particularly remember, my parents were bothered, this huge slate um, kitchen, which you can imagine in an, old, in an old vicarage, and at night time the cockroaches would come out or come in and run over the floor and it was dark and I said I know what I can do I'll bring in a hedgehog and I went out into the wild wood because we had a wild wood and picked up a hedgehog and brought it in to meet these I remember it so clearly it did eat some but I mean it wouldn't have cleared wouldn't have cured the problem of course and then the hedgehog went out in due course but that I think probably epitomizes a really wonderful childhood I had. And at that stage, my brother had brought me over and I met FAT, Frank Archibald Turk. And uh, he was taking classes in Camborne. And my brother, David, took me to these classes and he and his wife stayed as well to the classes. And then Frank was already taking some two or three people, private lessons and here, and so I came down to Shangri-La for the first time, if I recollect correctly, I think it was the end of 1941 or beginning of 1942. And the rest is history. I mean, I, we married in 1947, and uh, I helped him for a long time with might work that he was doing, acrology. None of that was paid. Whatever money he had, which was very, very little, was from adult education lectures five pounds for a set of six or something of that sort. I mean, also different from what it is now. And uh, Shangri-La then had no electricity, no running water, and, well, so much has been added since, as, as in most, most places it's now, uh, <laughs> you say, thoroughly civilised. And I think it's extraordinary, I don't know how people ever tell their life story because there are so many highways and byways going off in all directions and other people involved to influence one. I mean, never, one never thinks of oneself as influencing anybody else because you don't think of yourself as an entity. And I suppose, in a way, being human beings, we are social creatures and we don't really properly exist on our own. We're not only family, but we belong to our own particular, whether it be Cornish or Welsh or just English, whatever it may be, or British. And it's only, as happens with so many people over the years, that it's only 
excuse me, in looking backwards, that you begin to assess, I mean, talking to you now, you begin to think, well, when did I first become aware of Cornishness and the fact my father's proud of being proud of Cornish, when did it really dawn on me? And do the rest of the family think as I do? Because we've all grown up very, very differently. So there's a, it's a lot there for um, to be contemplated. I think when one lives in one place for a long time, it becomes so packed with memories in every step you take, with every plant you look at, that that in itself has a sort of boomerang, that's a good Australian word, isn't it? It has an effect which comes back to you, bounces off the things you look at. You don't always remember precisely where you had them or who gave them to you or where you might have bought them or the nursery which has now gone bankrupt because there are so many nurseries. It's all part of history and of course a very complex way of, well everybody's got a complex history and when you try and tease it out it becomes even more entangled to try and get the beginnings and the ends of things. Well I suppose over the years it's become even more important. We've talked about the garden but in the house itself uh, the sort of things that we've collected and treasured, things that have been given to us, the pictures that we have, and the library above all. And with my role, because I've always been, although I've done a little bit of writing, my main, I've, um, I've always been very, very practical. I love screwdriver and a hammer and nail. Of course, now I've just knocked my finger and knocked the nail, but I mean, it hasn't always been like that in the last few years. And so a lot of the things were done at Shangri-La with little money and with a do-it-yourself person, myself, and the people who did help us were always, well, they seemed to fall under the magic of Shangri-La and they always seemed to do an extra super job. And so it's all, all very special. Yes, I became interested in marine mollusks when I was living at Fioc and we were almost on the seashore. We lived in three different houses there, but we were in the narrow Rastrungut Point with the sea on either side of us, and with my brother Michael and a friend called Ambrose Littleton, and they bought a little, he bought a little boat called, and he called it the Stella Maris, and it leaked. <laughs> anyway, we managed to get up as far as Truro in it, I remember, but we used to paddle around, but mostly, of course, we were just on foot on the seashore, trying not but not to fall over, I can remember then leaping from boulder to boulder and one slippery bit of um, sloping rock to another. And that began my interest in mollusks and the zoning of mollusks and I wrote my first paper there, which was published in the Polytechnic Society. I think it was accepted when I was about 16 and looking back on it, I don't know how they ever accepted it, but I got a most beautiful medal for it. <laughs> it just seems extraordinary looking back. And so uh, from then on, and then I joined, I think other things overtook me, and then later on my interest was renewed and I joined the Conchological Society. And before I knew where I was, I was not in a marine recorder for many years, but that was followed by becoming the president. And of course, whilst I was a marine recorder, people sent me collections of shells to name or to check for them from various parts of the British Isles. So one became conversant with other uh, forms and we realised how lucky we are in Cornwall because what a great variety we have owing to the lots of sea and lots of different kinds of rock and lots of different exposure. Uh, and we've got um, a huge number I think the Helford is probably one of the top places in the whole of Britain for the number of mollusk species. I began by helping Frank as an assistant, for his, especially with his residential courses. He had residential courses at Boscastle and also in the Isles of Scilly, and I would help. And every now and then we'd have one of the inspectors come. Her Majesty's inspectors, and they usually became part of the course. I mean, they all fell for Frank anyway and thought he was wonderful. And they thought that I was sufficiently au fait with teaching and getting on well with students that I should take classes on my own. And I think the first one I took on my own was at Newquay. <laughs> 
And after that, of course, I did take a lot. Frank was delighted, and some of his classes, one at Lou particularly, was handed over to me. And so I did that. But I was, of course, a very practical person, as you've gathered, with a hammer and nails and so on. And I did a lot of field work and, and encouraged the students to do field work and what do, did they remember of the past and what was on their seashore now or their woodlands and so on. I remember we wrote a little handbook on Lou, which was virtually the work of the students from me quizzing them and so on and writing things down because I've always loved well, I've loved writing, I suppose, all the time, from when I kept, when I kept my mice, and you know, this horrible little squiggly writing, you know, mice have had babies today and they've eaten most of them or something like that. But anyway, I've always enjoyed writing and I would write up. I'd persuade the students, adult students, to send me in notes that they had made. They'd found, perhaps some of them would specialise, shall I say, in galls or in, um, well, with my, my mollusk was my thing, mammals, whatever, or the birds, of course, were a common thing, to send in what they had written, and then I would do, um, uh, not a praise I would do an account of the day, when it was, where it was, grid references had come into it by then, who was there, a long list of the students, and then I would write up on my old typewriter before computer days, um, all the results of well, what we've been doing. And gradually we were building up and going to places that weren't commonly visited with the idea of finding what was there in order that it could be assessed in relation to, shall I say, pressure from tourists, pressure from another, God forbid, another oil spill or from any kind of development. We were just taking photographs, and doing all we could. One place in particular I remember, and I remember this with great affection, Port Scatho. And somebody called, uh, what was his Christian? Edward Stepp, who had written lots of popular books um, in the Wayside and Woodland series and so on. At a time when he wasn't very well, he had gone to Port Scatho and he had done some recording, and this is all in one of his published books about what he called the long, it's known locally as the long drang. And you've probably heard of this term, Simon. It was a long, um, not a fissure, not a cave, a de not a depression. You could walk in it, you could look up either side, one facing north and one facing south, whatever, and look at the sponges on one side and the um, sea anemones on the other side and the rock pools at the bottom. It was, I mean, it was called a drang, and I can't remember what the nearest thing would be, but it was, it was something that many people could walk in. He had taken photographs of this, and he had got one of the local lads all these years ago to stand there with a fishing net. And so we, we reconstructed the book, the picture, and I've got this if you want to see it. I've got the picture that was taken by my friend, the various of us around, uh, and somebody holding the net, as this little boy had done, recreating what had been done all those years ago. And then, of course, we proceeded to record all that we reasonably could, the, 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 the fishes and the sea land rates, everything we could record, everything we could name, we named. And I uh, wrote quite a long thing on it. By then, I think we were beginning to get uh, um, nice typing. I didn't have to depend on my old typewriter. I think we eventually got quite a nice copy of that. So that, was, that meant Port Scatho, and that brought the past into the present, into the future. And so that still exists, and we sent it to one or two local people and so on. And hopefully it'll be used again when somebody wants to redo it. And another place we did an enormous detail, and many people have been there since, is St Ives Island. And at St Ives Island, at very low tide, you can go right out into the sea, into the, into the, the, the north side, wonderful. And of course, once you get all those rocks exposed, and we, I had a very eccentric lady, and I'll tell you a little bit more, because it's such a wonderful story. She was called Pippa Rennick, and she was a very vociferous, very keen member of my class. She died quite a few years ago. She was always, she was so enthusiastic that they had to have a special bell 
on the desk to stop her talking. I mean, we didn't say that in as many words, but because she had so much to say, so many questions, so much involved, she got so excited that uh, we had to say, you know, and let the tutor have a word now, sort of thing, or somebody else ask a question. Well, she was found, seen, noted, trying to do what I told them, but doing a transect on the floor. And do you guess what she was using? She, a very ingenious, she got a roll of toilet paper. And she was writing on the toilet paper, probably every sheet, I wouldn't know, what she found. A very ingenious way of doing it. But how eccentric, and of course the wind was blowing. And so she was seen there with the toilet, probably wrapping paper, probably wrapping around herself, trying to do this work on St Ives Island. I've never forgotten the picture that conjured up in my mind, but bless her, she was so keen. Many years ago, somebody called Norman Holm, who worked of, at the Marine Biological Association, had formed a special conservation area at Wembury in Devon. And I said, well, a very good place in Cornwall would be Helford. There's a lot of pressure there from visitors. And from what I have um, listed and noted and brought records together, it is one of the richest places for marine life in the whole of Cornwall, if you just take the Helford River, which is all packed into one 10 km square, SW72. And there's an enormous number of fishes and sea anemones and crustaceans and things that people have recorded over the years. It really is an, an, an extraordinarily unusual site. And um, so anyway, it was decided that this should follow on as being a conservation area. And Norman Holm and I um, called a meeting of all the local people, whether they were born locally or whether they lived locally. And we ended up with a room packed full of people, most of them against it, most of them very belligerent. And Frank had said to me, don't get too involved, Stella. Don't say too much. Be circumspect be careful what you say and so on. And so poor Norman took most of the flack and there was a lot of flack. I did come to his rescue, but <laughs> perhaps I should have come to his rescue earlier. Anyway, I said we only had the good of it in mind. There would be nothing legally bonded about, legally binding about it, but it was a very important site. It was worth recording the fact, it was worth treasuring this and bearing in mind where the various boats put their anchors and that sort of thing in relation to the uh, offshore life as well as the abundance of life that is on, on the shores. Anyway, it was all agreed, more or less, and we then managed to get the funding, then from Cornwall County Council, to employ two people. So we chose this young chap who'd never had a job before, we chose this girl, and the two of them had a year's survey work on the Helford, which was the beginning of all of this. And um, Pam is still organising, um, what shall I call them, reports on different groups. We've got a wonderful report on the birds. She and I did one on the mollusks. I um, can't remember about the crustaceans. I think there was a general one that we did on marine life. But, I mean, it just goes on and on. And I say it must be the most doc well-documented marine areas in the whole of... Um, I would say the whole of Britain. That's going it a bit, isn't it? But certainly the whole of Cornwall. Why were uh, people resistant to it initially? Why were they so involved with uh, the health? Why, why were... You mentioned that... Uh, people who attended that initial meeting were quite resistant. Oh, they were against it because they could see them being stopped in their activities, whether they were doing cockling, uh, collecting cockles for food, whether they were fishing, whether they were boating. There's an enormous number. It's a very multiple, multiple, has multiple usage. And you can imagine when they thought that it was going to have a national status, or at least a county state, doesn't eventually a national status, they could see activities being curbed. And at present, of course, holiday lets are common there. So much goes on in the Helford. I think we've I think one of the things that was written about the Helford were all the activities that go on. So oh yes, they were obviously against it because they thought some of the activities would be curbed and it was for us to say no they wouldn't. We just wanted people to be aware of the importance of the wildlife. <laughs>
and uh, to take care of it and certainly not to do undue development on the shore. Well, to begin with, when Frank started this, and it was part of the Institute of Cornish Studies, the idea was <laughs> very ambitious, to record everything it does live and has lived in Cornwall, going back to sub-fossil fossil things. We, have, we recorded a lot of fossils. And so we began with literature. Can you say a bit more about the use of uh, historic records? You just talked about using historic records to, I guess, reconstruct yes. um, you know, animal and, and plant or, or fossil populations. How do you deal with that? Because obviously you can't always assume that what's been recorded, whether it be 10 years ago or 50 years ago or 200 years ago, is necessarily accurate. Um, how did you respond to that? Constantly kind of checking, constantly revisiting places, uh, as this has happened over and over. I mean, Rose Murphy involved, she was the Botanical Society recorder for East Cornwall. Uh, and Colin is at present the one for West Cornwall. And so they, uh, they are extraordinarily thorough these days. And everything, I mean, Botanical Society, we've got a branch of it, if you like, in Cornwall. Uh, the Botanical Society likes things to be revisited every, I think it's every 10 years, preferably, and of course things to be checked. Of course there were, there were wrong identifications, there were um, hybridizations, there uh, were complications, but I think that the expertise in the flowering and fern, with the flowering plant and fern people, is so, um, I'm going to say deep or high or however or wide, whichever way you measure it, that you've got a, a, a wonderful thing. And also there's been a lot done on the mosses and the liverworts. And Jean Payton did a lot on those and wrote very authoritatively on them. But of course in the early days it was quite sufficient to give, if you're used to this sort of thing, 10 km squares as apart from a much smaller unit. Now we say on the left-hand side of a gatepost and we'll, we'll give a grid reference which will take you right there within a few yards of where it was found. But in the old, early days they did maps which showed you on a much bigger thing. I mean, for instance, to give you an idea, there were only four squares for the whole of the lizard. And now, well, if you look at, at, at a good grid square, there would be dozens and dozens of them, and these things are put in very, very precise, particular spot on Goonhilly Downs or wherever it might be. But it's different to what it was, whereas you'd have the local natural history societies who would be out recording the birds and the bees and the bugs. Now, there are the national groups, sometimes with a local a local section, sometimes the national one, in the way the Myriapod people have done, they'll come down to Cornwall and do some recording. And in nearly every instance, they'll know there's a record centre and they will feed them in. And so there's a it's difficult to say because in the early days, Victoria County history had a broad brush treatment and quite often they simply said so and so, very common, common everywhere. Because we want more than that. We want to know, as I say, which gatepost it was by and how valuable this minute information is. But in proportion to modern study, it does become vital to have that the detail which would be missing from the early records and also to find out what has become extinct and many, many things have become extinct. hope you're not going to ask me which ones have become extinct and for me to remember, but many of them have become either extinct or very rare. But because Cornwall is so very varied, varied in its um, the habitats it offers, from the sand dunes, from the tall cliffs, from the valleys on the cliffs, from the woodlands, um, the lakes, the streams, the rivers, many of them are very disjunct and of course the rivers go across, not down the, the county. And so again you have some fascinating things. Sometimes the absences are as important as their presences and that's where modern knowledge of natural history is such a help.
I mean, more and more, there are special parts of Cornwall and marshes and that, that for, in which a rare fern will grow. Um, the marsh fern is, grows, I think, in only two places in Cornwall. And unless we had made a note of that, unless we discovered it and, and written down that it was there, unless it was all written up in Cornish biological records, all the, the, the botanical records that Rose did for many years, uh, it you know wouldn't be it wouldn't be known so we've got to constantly be mentioning and logging what is found so that you can compare whether things are still there and so on I did do a lot of field work particularly marine work and a lot of this as I may already have said, was brought about the, by the Torrey Canyon problem and the fact that we realised if we had another oil spill, uh, we would want to know. I've got a, I took uh, the book that I have on the Torrey Canyon, done by the then director of the Marine Biological Association, done by, I mean, he was the editor of this book. It shows one particular picture of Travone and the rocks are just green green all over with the green algae that grew there to the exclusion of anything else because everything in the rock pools and all the ordinary seaweeds had died. They were stripped bare, not so much by the oil as by the detergent that was uh, poured all over the rocks. I mean, that was a problem itself. We didn't know how to deal with it. It was the first huge world incident. And um, a detergent seemed to be the way to deal with it so as to disperse the oil, but the detergent killed everything in the rock pools and on the things. And this particular picture in this book, which you must, uh, I must get the book back for you to see, it just shows a, a mass of green. It's quite spectacular and very interesting because Travone had been chosen many, many years before as a good site to record. And so we knew what used to be there. And after that, I went there with two or three other people, and again we recorded all we could. Remember, it was a storm of rain coming down. It was extraordinary. We got the list that we did. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I did concentrate more on marine things. It was precipitated by Torrey Canyon. I do believe there is a big one-way change going on, and already we are finding species that will live here now that would have had a job to live through our winters before, because we've had milder winters. I mean, you always get the exceptions. <laughs> we've just been through quite a tough winter. But generally speaking, you'll find there are more plants and animals that can survive our winters. And again, it's rather difficult. There are so many people now involved, including some of the people looking at the more minute things, that have they been overlooked in the past and they were there all the time, I think this is where the plant people are so important because they've combed the uh, Cornwall so thoroughly looking in every tiny nook and corner. And incidentally, um, Ian will tell you more about this, they are finding things that were recorded 100, 150 years ago and people at the time just said oh, such and such a point or such and such a part of Cornwall, but they didn't do what we do now giving a minute grid reference and they're finding by looking slightly to the right or the left or in front of where they thought it would be they're finding certain things are still there the lizard is often taken as one of the places in cornwall which has been very very remote and very much of its flora and again others will talk about that in a more learned way than i can but i do know that the mesembryanthemums that have been brought in from South Africa and which people, that is, visitors, love and they get affronted when they see the local um, wardens pulling these things up, these big fleshy things like carpet brotus with flowers like big water lilies and they're all growing on the cliff. But the trouble is they are pushing out some of our smaller plants which grow only either at the lizard and sometimes in the Channel Isles, a few are unique to the lizard. Uh, and so what do you do if you're a botanist? You want to keep those things that are unusual, and botanists come down here from all over the world, and particularly 
to the Lizard. The Botanical Society has excursions down to the Lizard to see these things. And when you find that a South African intruder, beautiful in its own right, no doubt, is spreading right across some very special thing which has grown there for centuries and centuries, you get a little bit cross. Uh, so I suppose I'm on the side of being very careful not to let the introductions escape very much and to think of what they might do because they, uh, they say they, they spread and they, they destroy other things. But of course everything, every plant wants to be the top, I say the top dog, the top plant and uh, they don't want any competition. And I often think, and of course, the very ambitious ones can almost spread across the world. They're so, I mean, one in particular that I've got, which is, comes from India, uh, it's, a, it's the Indian strawberry, which um, you're almost sitting on, is, is competing with the ordinary wild strawberries. And it's all over the garden. Many people say, what a lovely little plant, can I have a piece? And so it's spreading over lots of gardens now in Cornwall. And the point I wanted to make was, it is the way of things. Man has spread things himself, he's, he's deliberately carried them. But apart from what he has deliberately brought across the world, things have found their own way across the world. And we ourselves have moved them from garden to garden. So you get a profusion. And of course, an ex a sort of conglomeration of plants, as there must be even here. I mean, many plants of Cornish gardens, many of them, of course, are very, very well known. They are plants from all over the world. Uh, so, very difficult, really, because what one person appreciates, another one doesn't mind so much if it goes. But I think that. I mean, there's certain changes that are going on that are due to climate change that we can do very little about, except cry if we see something which we think is so wonderful going and others coming in. You quite might say, well, this is natural, we can't do much about it. But I think when people deliberately plant, as I think some, now what was, it? I know they were planting at one stage, People were very upset, local people were very upset, and, well, non-local people, various naturalists, they were planting rhododendrons, which are not a native species. I wouldn't say all over Bodmin Moor, but in parts of Bodmin Moor. And down in our valley, they were changing things quite a lot and planting things which wouldn't normally be there. I think you want to try and go along with nature and not bring in different soils and different plants as far as you can, let things develop as they will. But nothing stays the same. I think when you get really into the, I say into the heart of nature, you realise that things are, are varying all the time. But I was very, very proud of that. Being a Cornish bard, so they were there. But it's strange how these things happen. I mean, you. You think when, when you're, you're a little girl turning over stones and thinking about wildlife, you don't know what it may lead to <laughs> without, any, without any planning or thoughts, which I suppose is part of it because you, you work as an amateur and not as a professional. Cause I've, I think I've said to you before that I mean, I, mean, I became, of course, I was a tutor later on in life. Uh, but to begin with, all this was done as Frank did it just for the love of studying wildlife.